then please switch off your camera. And otherwise, we are happy to see people and not um, two letter codes of people in the video as well. The real people and not the acronyms. So then here's an official welcome. Hello everyone to the second uh, to our today's session on on the train the trainer capacity building program of the connect heat project. Our today's focus is on the technological framework uh, with a focus on on heat pumps. This is basically our session 2.2 on the technological framework with the specificity of heat pumps. I'm myself, for all of those who don't know me yet, I'm Matthias watzak helmer I'm working for Federen as project manager, and I'm supported today from my colleagues, Marta and Clemence, who also work at Federen. And I would like to welcome especially all, and thanks to all the speakers in advance for, for providing input today. First, we go to some small housekeeping rules. So your microphones, should be muted during the session to allow the speakers to not be disturbed. Um, if you have questions, please raise your hand. We will always have an eye on on this um, and let the speakers know that there are questions in the room. So you don't have to worry. We will interrupt you in case of questions. Um, if, if you have questions for later on, you can already put them in the chat. We will have a question answer session after the presentations. So no worries. Um, these questions will be answered also from the chat. So immediate questions, please, uh, for example, for the understanding, then please raise your hand and otherwise we can have it in the Q&A session at the end. And again, this meeting will be recorded and made available on our project page, uh, including the slides from the speakers. So in the next slide, you can see a basic theme of our capacity building program. We have foreseen six sessions. Um, today, we end a session um, on the technological framework with a special focus on, on heat pumps. So to remind you, this is um, the capacity building event for uh, the consortium. So to build up the skills and knowledge for systematic, holistic and efficient planning and developing of heating and cooling community energy projects within all the regions. And this uh, knowledge will later be used to have a cascading effect of the knowledge transfers to the European level, uh, to the from the European level as we are to the regional context of the pilot implementations. So what brings us here today? The first out of this um, six trainers in trainer session, um, we are here in the, um, we are gonna have this input on heat pumps. Today's agenda, um, we will start with uh, Harald. Thanks a lot for, for joining us uh, on the topic of absorption heat pumps. Um, in theory and practice and follow, um, following his presentation, Arne will present um, on geothermal energy and should give us insights on very interesting examples and solutions. And after that, Gabriele is going to talk about uh, waste heat and the uh, usability of waste heat as an energy source. Afterwards, we will have a Q&A session <coughs> and um, some wrap up and conclusions. Without further ado, um, Please now welcome Harald, um, Harald Blaschek, who is founder of Steps Ahead and expert in absorption heat pumps. Since 2002, internationally active in industrial plant engineering, including 10 
years in the field of energy efficiency and renewables. Harald will give us more insights on absorption heat pumps in theory and practice. So please take the floor and you can share the screen. And thanks again for joining us today. Thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, I'm always happy uh, to show uh, some of the topic that uh, is for me one of the very interesting topics in uh, in energy systems. So let me share my screen first. And please, uh, one of you tell me when, when the screen is visible. It's fine. We can see it. Thanks. Fine. Uh, I have prepared a number of slides, so when we have questions, we can we uh, can go into detail a little more. And let me start with uh, saying a few words about Steps Ahead Energy System. Mm -hmm. I am founder and CEO, uh, together with my friend, old friend uh, Michael Barnick. He has worked in power plant business for more than 20 years. We both founded the company in 2016. And until now, uh, we have uh, nine large scale systems, which you, you will see a little bit later in an overview. What are we doing? Uh, I say this in some kind of Pareto principle. Uh, for approximately 90% of our work, we do the work of engineering and consulting. For about, uh, when looking on our income, about 90% of our income comes from selling machines. So, we are financially seen, we are a dealer for absorption machines. Technically seen, we are an entity that does, that takes care from the very first uh, design considerations uh, through the whole lifetime to the uh, maintenance and optimization of the machines. First person, that's me. Second person is Michael. You will see it in uh, uh, later in the uh, download of your project, uh, you will find a PDF. And so let me start the technical part. Uh, I am speaking about absorption heat pumps. Uh, the topic of compression heat pumps is more or less a non-topic for me today. 25 or 30 system, minutes? Yes, I do. I do and uh, I have my own uh, uh, control to right in front of me. <laughs> uh, looking to the what's the the big difference between absorption heat pumps or, or the characteristic uh, situation of the absorption heat pumps? They are driven by heat, not by electricity or a mechanical work. Uh, looking into different heat driven cooling processes or heat pump processes, we will focus today on the most common uh, process, which has in large systems more than 100,000 machines worldwide in the last two or three decades. This is um, a machine where water is the refrigerant medium and lithium bromide salt is the absorbent of the process. Historically, the technology is more than 200 years old. It, at the end of the 18th century, 17 something, the principle was uh, under research by different persons. And at the beginning of the 19th century, the first absorption machine was built. We have then in this all this development several interesting steps. Uh, I integrated in the slide one. Uh, for me, curious uh, machine, which was uh, developed by Albert Einstein and uh, his colleague, Mr. Szilard. And today, uh, two main types of, mach of absorption machines are on the market. Uh, one is the water and lithium bromide machine. And with a smaller market presence, there are also machines uh, available in the market that work with ammonia as refrigerant and water as absorbent. So starting from this background, I think it will help us most when we understand the process of an absorption machine. And I'm, I will mind the 30 minutes, uh, no problem with that. 
but I think we all should invest uh, a few minutes for understanding this process. Any heat pump takes low temperature heat on a certain temperature level and reject this heat to clients on a higher temperature level. The absorption heat pump is driven by heat, so we have energy inputs, the driving energy, we have an energy input, the low temperature energy, and we have the energy output. And looking on the functional principle of the machine, uh, I start in the evaporator. And I start with a question, uh, when you want to cool down this external uh, water flow, uh, which comes from any type of waste heat source, uh, how can you cool this inside the machine in the most efficient way? The answer is water is irrigated uh, on, in form of fine water droplets on the heat exchanger pipes inside the machine. And for having uh, a good uh, cooling effect on these pipes, the water shall boil in the machine. It shall immediately turn to steam. And this means when I want to have boiling water with a heat input at 25 degrees C, I need low pressure. So the whole machine body is under vacuum, or in other words, under a pretty low pressure steam atmosphere. Producing the steam cools this circuit, but we run into the next problem. The steam is an amount of gas in an enclosed volume and leads to the fact that the pressure is rising. This would lead to an increased temperature on the low pressure side, so we need to get rid of the steam. And here again, the comparison between a compression machine and an absorption machine. The compression machine compresses the evaporated gas uh, uh, from the evaporator. The absorption machine absorbs this gas. And the absorbance is in this case a six with these temperatures as shown in the screen in the uh, slide. 63% salt, 37% water, and this is highly hygroscopic. This means the steam is uh, caught by the lithium bromide solution. By this, the pressure is maintained and we can permanently cool the low temperature source. And the result in the absorber is that the strong solution, 63% salt content, is diluted by approximately 3%, 4%, meaning the result is a weaker salt solution than we had at the beginning. What do I need for making a weak salt solution with lower salt content for concentrating it again? I pump it up to another level, to a higher level, higher temperature, higher pressure. I boil it up by adding heat as driving energy. Again, the steam is evaporated from this salt solution and is condensed on the cool pipes in the condenser. Oops. Uh, so this is the process of the machine. And in practi for practical machines, the evaporator has one pump more. For practical machines, the uh, salt solution has a plate heat exchanger between the hot and strong solution that comes down and shall become colder. And the weak solution, the solution with less salt content, that shall be preheated before it comes to the generator. And this is all what you need for an absorption machine. How does that look like? Uh, up, 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 jumping a little bit. This is a big absorption machine. It is an absorption chiller with 16 megawatt of cooling capacity. And this is a small absorption machine uh, uh, at the Technical University in Berlin. You see the four heat exchangers that we have seen in the drawing. And the fifth heat exchanger, this one is a plate heat exchanger for the salt solution and the pump. 
that's it. And if people know absorption machines, most of them know them as a chiller for producing cooling for air condition. This is exactly the same machine, just working on other temp temperature and pressure levels. But economically, there is a big difference. And that is something where we uh, need to look at. When I use an absorption heat pump, my driving energy is one megawatt. This machine can lift up a low temperature heat of 0 0.7 meg megawatt, delivering a benefit of 1.7 megawatt. When you produce 1.7 megawatt of hot water with a boiler, this boiler would consume gas or oil or biomass or whatever for approximately 1.9 megawatt. Now doing the same comparison for the chiller, for the electric cooling machine. With a driving energy of one megawatt, you will cool 0 0.7 megawatt, and the benefit is only the cooling at the chiller. And if a compression machine does a cooling of 0 0.7 megawatt, it has a, an, an electricity consumption of approximately 140 kilowatt. And most people know the absorption chiller and make the fault that they don't realize that absor absorption heat pumps bring the much, much bigger economical benefit. So before I go to some project examples, any questions uh, on the topics so far? Waiting a little bit. Okay, then I will continue. Thanks. Uh, looking into such a machine in the production, this is uh, the machine body where the pipes of the heat exchanger arrays will be mounted in. And this is a typical uh, production site from one of the manufacturers. Interestingly, all commercially relevant manufacturers today are in China. Uh, there is one in, in India, there is one in Korea, but the big ones are, are the Chinese companies. Okay. Now the machine looks a little bit different. What's the difference? It's not driven by hot water anymore. Now it is di directly driven by a fuel. And what is the result? When you use an absorption machine as a boiler, you invest fuel of 10 megawatt, bringing a heating capacity inside of 9 megawatt. And this type of boiler can additionally benefit from low temperature heat. So whenever you have sites where you have a boiler and a waste heat source, you can consider replacing this boiler to such a type of absorption machine. And you will get from 10 megawatt of fuel, 15.5 megawatt of hot water, which is not so bad for a boiler. I omit the simulation of such machines. Uh, Steps Ahead simulates the machines. We know all the details when we do this, but in an overview presentation as today, we can proceed. And I go to some project examples. One of the most important uh, applications for absorption chillers are biomass heating plants, because in the, in the uh, exhaust gas of biomass plants, there is much humidity from the humid wood chips. And with the help of, the, of an uh, heat pump, you can recover this heat. This is the first project that Steps Ahead built for a biomass plant. Uh, this is uh, the rough schematic of this plant. And talking in energy numbers, uh, this is the diagram that shows how, how much heat can be recovered. The vertical axis is percentage additional heat gains uh, in percent of uh, the uh, lower calorific value of the wood chips. And the horizontal axis is the gas. How cold can I make my flue gas? 
And you see already, uh, when you cool down the flue gas to 75 degree, you get only a few percent. When you cool it down to 65 degree, only a few percent. But when the water in the, in the flue gas starts condensing, starts to form droplets, then the harvest is big. And when district heating uh, systems have a relatively low return flow temperature, 50 degree, you can reach this area. So this is what we call a passive flue gas condensation. This already can harvest 15, in very good cases, 20% of the energy. And when using a heat pump, you can harvest much, much more. What are these different brown lines? The highest one are wood chips with 60% water content, 55% water content. And this is the area of typical wood chips, 50%, 45%, 40 35%. This is where most of the, the uh, plants in Austria are working. And green value on top. This was a value that we reached in 2020. The flue gas system of, of the Wagrain plant had an additional harvest of 48% of the uh, boiler heating capacity, which is quite a spectacular value. A short overview uh, on a few systems that we built, in this case only the biomass systems. Vagrain, you have seen this picture already. The next one was in Strass, the next one was in Sekirchen, the next one was in Bialos. These are all heating plants. And in Klagenfurt, we have installed already three heat pumps in three different power plants. And they are uh, for sure much larger, the heating plants are usually the smaller systems. And in red color, 20 to 30% more energy from the same amount of fuel. So this is the benefit that we have from such an active flue gas condensation. What is the operating cost? Well, I don't invest for any driving energy. I have the heat anyway and the heat is produced for making district heating, and the heat is just better used. So I can get these 20 to 30% more energy output without additional fuel consumption. And this is the spectacular reason why uh, absorption heat pumps have such a good uh, market potential. The big power plants can have a payback of two years, the biomass system usually have a payback of five years, six years, seven years, something in that range. Again, a simulation screen, just in the big overview. Uh, the fuel goes to a boiler. The boiler has its flue gas path. There is a buffer storage and there is the heat pump. And the whole system design is needed so that all uh, components fit well to each other. This is especially relevant uh, in systems like in Gerlos, because in Gerlos uh, we use only 105 degrees C from the boiler as driving energy. The typical temperature is more in the range of 150 degrees C. I need to, le to look a little bit on the timeline, so I speed up here. Some other machine types. When the district heating grid has a return temperature of 80 degrees C, 80 to 100 on the heat sink, you need another type of absorption machine. You need a type with this internal red circuit as additional circuit, then you still can deliver cold water. And this is a design done by a manufacturer. Uh, reaching 35 degrees C on the cold water side. The next slide is a design done by steps ahead. In this case, not for 80 to 100 degree, but for 70 to 90 degree and delivering 11 degrees C cold water. Why is this cold water temperature so relevant? The colder it is, the bigger the harvest. And this means the more money you get out from the system. This is still on the level of draft. 
this machine will be confirmed by a manufacturer within December, then we can remove this uh, draft note on it. Some other systems, this machine is in a paper mill. Uh, harvesting waste heat in a paper mill uh, from a relatively low temperature level, uh, 46 degrees C, and making it useful for the district heating system of the city of Graz was a difficult project because the mechanical room for placing the heat pump was very, very small, and it was 12 meter above the ground. And another system at the brick production of the company Wienerberger. Uh, this heat pump is special because it's not driven by hot water or not driven by a, a fuel, but driven by 400 degree hot air. I omit this project that's already old. You will find it later in the PDF. And I want now to show a big mistake that we do in Europe. This is a big power plant for a big uh, city district heating grid, uh, as we do it in Europe, in America, in Eastern Europe. And a boiler produces steam, runs a turbine. The steam from the turbine uh, is sent to a heat exchanger and heats the city. And the smarter way is you use this steam for driving the heat pump and you take additional low temperature input from the uh, waste heat from the cooling tower. And remember, one part driving energy, 0 0.7 parts low temperature heating integration. Some examples for more than 10 years already, this is done in Asia, mainly in China, roughly 250 heat pumps of the type are already installed. And we still don't see this in Europe. We are still on the very first level of this application in Europe, not, not a single type of this style already existing. And this is really huge. Uh, the, the numbers here were systems with 200, with 300 megawatt. And uh, we tend to say that, the, uh, that uh, Asian product, uh, products are often copying are often bad quality, etc. But I strongly contradict that. This is the Chinese power plant with Michael and me on uh, during a visit. And this system is already in operation for several years. And in this case, we are the slow ones in Europe. I must clearly state that. That's another big machine. Uh, it was two years ago the biggest machine worldwide and each of it a capacity of 73 megawatt. Power plant simulation, I speed up and I want to show a few slides more on other applications. You are working on uh, heating applications. You are working in your project on cooling applications. And when you have a district heating grid, uh, you sometimes run into capacity problems uh, in the transport of the energy. And so let us again look on a large system. 3.2 gigawatt of uh, district heat, huge, huge pipes, 1,400 millimeter in diameter for each pipe and 50 kilometer pipe length and 20 degree return temperature. So who could be the consumer for a system that brings back a so-called return flow? And the answer is simple. On the left side, I have the production side. This is the side of the power plant. On the right side, I have the consumer, which in this case gets only low temperature, 37 to 45 degrees C. And the absorption machine is actively cooling the return flow. So the power plant side gets a colder return than uh, the consuming side has given. Normally, when you have 37 degrees C at the consumer and you have a heat exchanger in between, you would have 40 degrees C on the left side. Some few other machines, and then we are through with the, with the 30 minutes. Lithium bromide machines can go 
down to minus five degrees C. Uh, but I explained at the beginning, the refrigerant is water. So how can you in a machine with an evaporation of water, how can you produce uh, temperatures below zero degrees heat? This again has a simple answer. You see this tiny yellow pipe here for the middle chamber. This is for contaminating the water uh, the refrigerant in this machine with a very little bit of salt. And as you know from the salt in the street in winter time, if you have some salt in the water, the freezing point will be lower. And this allows us with a strictly controlled uh, salt concentration on the evaporator side, this allows the production of minus degree C, minus five degrees C. <clears throat> Last machine uh, that I want to show for today, the so-called category two heat pump, also called heat transformer. And here, the first example that I show is a low temperature application. Uh, now we look from the right to the left. The heat input is a waste heat stream, 65 degrees C to 55 degrees C. And this stream is divided in two more or less equal uh, energy flows. Roughly 50% or typically 45 to 48% of this energy is raised to a higher level. So the client gets here the 95 degree C hot water and uses 55 degree water as driving energy. And this is physically possible when you reject 50% of this uh, waste heat source on the lower temperature level. Then you do not hurt the second law of thermodynamics. When is this machine interesting? Looking back to the first slide with the first absorption heat pump, you need a driving energy for raising low temperature heat to a higher level. And the category two machine is different. It uses the waste heat itself for driving the, the machine, raises this waste heat to a higher level for 54, 45 or 48% of this uh, uh, amount of energy. And the rest is rejected to cooling water. So uh, 10 degree cooling water, how is this possible? A cooling tower cannot deliver 10 degree C. You only have that at the lake or at the seaside or against groundwater. But when do you need district heating? You need the most in winter time. And so this can be very interesting in winter time because you don't need a driving energy anymore. If you run a biomass power, uh, heating plant, if you have driving energy available, uh, then no need for taking this type. If you don't have a driving energy, this is a very uh, interesting type of machine. And one other example, now significantly warmer temperatures. This is an example from a paper mill in paper industry. In paper mills, you often have uh, waste heat higher, than, warmer than uh, 100 degrees C, but you have no users. You need steam uh, uh, in the paper mill, but not hot water. And this machine can produce steam. And so a waste heat flow that is typically lost to 100% can be made useful by 50%. The diagram. I just want to show that you find it on our website. This is the process of the lithium bromide absorption machine in a diagram that shows the uh, boiling temperature of the water on one scale and the boiling temperature of the salt solution on the other scale. When you just look on the project side, when you don't look in the details of the machine, you will not need it. If you need it, that's the place where you can download it. So. Thank you for the attention.
my last slide. Steps Ahead is working in a couple of R&D projects. Absolute was working on absorption machines in district heating and district cooling. It will end in uh, 2024, probably not in March, but in September, but uh, this is more or less already done. And two other projects have just started. In case that you are interested, just please send me a mail or give me a call. Thank you and open for questions or we shift to the next presentation. Thank you, Harald. Thanks a lot for this very interesting presentation. I have a couple of questions for myself, but I think I can postpone them to the Q and A um, session in the end. Are there some okay. direct question which you would like to ask Harald for understanding from the audience, or I will give you a couple of seconds. Otherwise, we can go on and continue with our next speaker, Arne. Thanks a lot and welcome again to our today's session. Arne is a planner and developer of heat pump solutions at his company WP Plus, BP Plus. Um, Arne will give us more information about uh, geothermal energy as with a focus on the collector type. So it's a ring collector and has very interesting examples um, to show about the implementation, covering the range from smaller installations to, to larger system installations as well. So thanks, Anne, for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, respect to Harald for this very high level uh, technical presentation. And uh, um, I'm glad to be there with him because I think we, we can show how broad the application of heat pump can be. Um, I start with a presentation very short of uh, my my business, my engineering office. We are consultants for HVAC and our mission is to bring the COP, the technical performance of the machine uh, from the company to a system, to a given system, optimize the planned system to a seasonal performance where we have a calculation of how much thermal energy have I received during a year and how much electric um, energy I have to pay on my bill. So we are talking about uh, now compression compression heat pumps and uh, the sources and they are always systems the heat pump itself is nothing it's it's not like a refrigerator you buy you put to the plug and it's working if you uh, get the heat pump delivered the work starts and the planning work has must be done already um, we have three parts we have the source we have the heat pump itself and we have the heat sink and each of these part is at the same level in our view and um, maybe 10 years ago we put a lot of effort to the to the sources like the ring trench collector Matthias noticed and the last years we put the same effort to the heat sink to make heat sinks cooling floors heating floors cooling walls heating walls cooling and heating ceilings to make it the best system for the heat pump for efficiency and for the people living, working in those houses for their comfort at the same time, at the same level. So we, we developed uh, some systems which are now open source and uh, each installer, each uh, company can uh, take it in their um, portfolio. And um, hydraulics are very important and sizing, dimensioning of heat pumps is very important. Those are the two parts where we see the most mistakes in already made solutions. Um, then we talk about tubs. Tubs means thermal activated building structure. So the concrete of the structure itself will get the heat exchanger for heating and cooling application. And uh, another points at the end of this list is the sector coupling. We will have a slide to this uh, very special and important item and uh, the monitoring. We do a lot of monitoring. I think 12, 14 
percent of the projects we are doing during a year, maybe 300, 350, we are monitoring for maybe 10 years. And uh, we learn a lot out of this. And we also do the monitoring for example, industry heat pump companies to get better parameters for the heat pumps at uh, initial installing. And we do a training, for example, in Austria for all installers and planners at the IIT, Austrian Institute of Technology, in connection with the Austrian Heat Pump Association, there is a training for installers. As we see, one of the biggest problems we have to lose, uh, to choose to, 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 to solve in Europe is uh, the knowledge of installers because they come from uh, a time where they have only learned about hot deliveries of heating, of um, burning stuff. And with uh, heat pumps, we do the opposite. And um, a German SHK, um, the group of installers, the, the, the base company, said uh, they have the idea that only 15% of German installers are ready for heat pumps. So this is really one of the big items we have to uh, target. Um, also in Austria and I think in all European countries. Okay, there I will... Uh, follow with the information in the PDF of my slides with um, with a slide to soil to heat. Soil to heat is an Austrian German network um, changing all the knowledge about such geothermal heat pump solutions from um, science about industry to planners to installers. And uh, this slide will be filled in. When we look um, to the source, to the geothermal source, it's a uh, the perfect source for heat pumps because it's a base load ready. We don't need um, extra heaters, we don't need electric boost heaters. It's everywhere available as each uh, house is standing on ground, on surface, and many houses have gardens, and if they don't have gardens, we can drill borehole heat exchangers down the ground. And it's uh, the idea that the energy is not coming from the pipeline or from the tank ship, the oil tank ship, the energy is coming from the own plot of land from the own garden. And the fuel is uh, served by the sun. In Austria, we have more than 45 years of experience with, for example, collector systems, um, very shallow systems, flat systems. We mean that we do these collectors not with drilling machines, we do them with uh, digging machines. And so we need some space. And if we have uh, single houses with a garden, this was a standard solution in Austria many, many years ago, but it uh, came to a kind of um, end 10, 15 years ago, when we saw the, the solution, the source was very isolated, not integrated into the the shape of the house, of the plot of land. And um, um, funny or maybe not funny effect, then uh, swimming pools as a comfort feature were rising and we had to make the choice. The owners had to make the choice, will I run a swimming pool or will I run a geothermal source? And that's a very, very bad uh, question when we look to the big uh, problems we have to solve in future. So this was a kind of initial starting sequence for the ring trench collector when we said okay it's very simple to do the same size the same exchanger the same source but we go to the outside of the of the plot of land now we have uh, ready-made solutions for each house which uh, is built you can order this at the shop, a ready-made uh, ground source heat exchanging solution. It's uh, quite easy to install. You get a professional planning and you even can order a professionist to show you how to do it. But it's really a kind of open source idea there and it's made to integrate the owners of the house to be also there to install their source. And we train a lot of installers, I think we have already trained maybe 300 in Austria to know how to do it. This is a short, uh, brief overview about the uh, installations we have done the last eight, nine years in Austria. Um, also up to Germany, um, Denmark, to Holland. 
but uh, our focus is in Austria as we um, are a very, very uh, small company. Now we change the point of view and we look from the heat pump to the geothermal source and from the look of the heat pump, it's the perfect source because we have the maximum of efficiency we can run a seasonal performance of five to six as a standard in new buildings with low temperature heat sinks. Five to six means in this case for one kilowatt hour electricity, I get five to six kilowatt hours of thermal energy to heat my house. It's the divisor for the thermal last of the house. And we have the maximum lifetime. There is no weathered technical equipment in the outside. Everything is installed inside the house or under the surface. We have the maximum flexibility as a store source for sector coupling with the grid with a very volatile energy producing in our electricity grid, which will rise more and more volatile. And um, if we use um, air as a source, we see that during nighttime, the air can maybe be 10 um, degrees, 10 Kelvin colder than during daytime, which means the COP is going down by maybe 25%. And we have to put 30, 32% more electricity inside. So this is a kind of lock in. We don't have this with the, um, with the ground source because it's really constant not if it's outside cold or mild or if there's storm or if there's rain or snow. And the last point, which is rising more and more important, very strong depending on the point where you live in Europe, it's the free or passive cooling. Ground heating is ground cooling. In cooling case, we don't even need the heat pump because we have a natural temperature of 5, 10, 15 degrees inside our sewers, inside the ground the soil, and we can directly use this temperature to support the house. And we can run here a COB of 50, what means that with one electric kilowatt hour, we can transport 50 kilowatts of thermal load, heat load in summertime from the house to the, to the ground. This is a chart from um, my own house where I'm already sitting now and we see um, all the year, the 12 months, and we see the, the plot of land, the garden, the house as a source, an energy source. We have the photovoltaics on the roof and we have a 5.1 kilowatt hour peak source and we have a borehole of about 6 kilowatt going down 160 meters. And now we see that the sun is centered to summertime, no surprise, but our demand of thermal energy is centered to wintertime. So we see the strongness of the ground source, which can deliver the, deliver the energy exactly when we need it. We don't have to do uh, by ourselves, by some technical approach, this shift. Geothermal means a natural shift from summertime to wintertime, from solar input to wintertime energy output. This is a, a study in from Austria, from Niederösterreich, and um, it uh, was following the question, what is the conflict between plants and thermal use of the garden? Um, there is no conflict at all because the thermal use is running in wintertime and the plants are active in summertime. But uh, there are also some nice graphs which were done by temperature measurement. And you can see this uh, petrol colored um, graph in the middle. It's the ambient temperature outside the air temperature. And no surprise, it's centered to July, August by its maximum. And then you can see the ground temperatures around the the collector, the source level, and you see up to three months of phase shifting, three months of peak shifting from the temperature peak from summertime to autumn, early winter. And just now in the first weeks of heating season, we have the highest yearly temperatures there. So it's a nice gift for all the solutions of this item. How can we shift solar surplus from summertime to the demand in wintertime? Um, short overview, how a project like this can look. Each project looks different. We have more um, a solution than we have a product here. 
On the left side, we see a kind of a double place, double garden, parcel. And in the middle time, you see the plan for the sewers, which is on the left side already marked. And uh, on the right side, the excavation machines that have begin have begun their digging job. Then the, the construction of the house starts and the bricks are built up, but already the source is here. You can see the green pipes laying there, waiting there until the house is built up. On the right side, there is the um, ceiling mounted. And you see the, the ceiling, the base ceiling, which will be finished on site and the pipes for the exchanging are already installed here. You can see it in the middle slide for the first level ceiling and you can see it on the right slide for the second level ceiling. And this is a perfect system, this TAPS thermal activated building structure, because at the same time you can use it for heating, you can use it for cooling and you can use it for storing as a storage for the energy because there is so much uh, capacity in it. Um, it's maybe the equivalent to 20, 30,000 liters of a water boiler. This is the electric load for um, single or uh, two family houses, for small houses, standard load profile. You can see um, during night time we have low load and in the morning we have a peak, the coffee peak, and in the evening we have another peak, the television and cooking peak. And um, the, the art to solve the problem is now how can we put here in electric driven heat pumps without um, rising the peak. So we have to put them mainly during night time, during the low load time. And I will show you now by the uh, measurement of my electric meter how this runs in my home. And I think it's a quite nice example how to make the heat pump, the electric driven heat pump from a problem to a solution by load shifting. This is already available for everyone in Austria for I think five or six years. I was very proud to be the testing house to, to um, invent this solution for everyone here in combination with a heating electricity delivering company and the heat pump installer company. And now for this picture, the question is where is the gas heater and where is the heat pump? And it's maybe not so easy to see it at the first view. When you look a little bit deeper inside it, you will see there is the exhaust which the heat pump on the right side does not have. But this is the direct replacement if we go to flats and have heating systems and how to install little small wall mounted heat pumps inside. This is the way they look. It's a heat pump, it's not a gas heater. There is a very new project in Austria, in Tirol, Innsbruck. It was done one year ago. There are 52 flats in this residential house, in this domestic house. And um, um, in each flat, there's a heat pump now. And the costs different to gas heaters were only by maybe 15, 17 percent higher. But now the question is how to give them a source. Each heat pump needs a source. And if we would run here air heat pumps, we would have to need very, very huge pipes of a meter of diameter. And uh, if we use uh, brine water heat pumps, the size of the piping is not larger than the gas pipes. We can go by the chimney or we can go through the middle of the stairway, which was done in this kind of application. If we look to heat pumps, we see the, the exergy, electricity driving the compressor, and we see the energy, the free um, energy outside. We can pick up from the air, from the ground, from water, from waste, from nearly everywhere, because it's uh, energy on a low temperature level, some kind of waste of free energy. Together, it's a hot energy that we can directly use uh, as we know it now from each big city in Europe. And uh, the possibility of electric heat pumps is that we don't transport the hot energy, we transport the cold energy. 
the energy on the natural temperature level. And the exergy, the electricity, to make it hot, to make it usable, we add at the consumer in the flat in the house. Each flat, each house has an electricity connection. So this is quite easy done. And now we look what this possibility of the technology gives us on advantages. We go now through three kind of grids we have now for deliver energy, residential energy. And uh, the first one is the third generation. We have high temperature delivery on about maybe 100 degrees Celsius. We need a lot of insulation on our pipes and we have a lot of losses through long pipes for longer distances. And this system cannot be scaled up much more. Now we look at the fourth generation. It's a little better because uh, the temperatures are not that high anymore. The losses are a little bit lower, but still expensive piping as they must be insulated very well. And we can now for the first time use uh, energy heat pump systems in the center of production. And now we make the big switch to the fifth generation. And the fifth generation delivers cold energy. This sounds quite uh, uh, special. Cold energy, but it's the source of the heat pumps. And the heat pumps are now decentral at the consumer. They can be in the center of a house for all the flats, but they can also be in each flat as a small one. Both is possible. And uh, the source is now a collector or boreholes or also an air exchanger. Everything is possible. We don't have insulated piping anymore. It's a lot cheaper. And if we have a long distance to go, we don't have losses. We earn energy. We collect energy during the transportation way. This is the big, big difference when we look at cold local heat energy grids. We deliver energy. We don't deliver temperature. The temperature is just a, a point which makes the energy usable and it will be added at the flat. Now we look uh, through um, a brief overview of uh, solutions. We have a nice castle here. The source was very easy done because there was a huge garden, a huge plot, plot of land. Uh, maybe the more interesting question is how to make a castle heat pump ready. Then there we have um, um, some kind of um, swimming utility. It's not a swimming pool, it's, um, it's a fixed installed one. And uh, we don't have to dig one hour more here for the source. The source is just uh, an add-on and this is very, very cheap. You just have to be at the right time at the right place. And uh, the owner of the place has to know about the possibility that he can do two things at one work. Then we have uh, here a wine yard and uh, this was also very easy done because it was not even dicked. It was made with the special machine, which uh, makes it very easy to install a piping inside the earth. There we have a kind of fish pond and uh, a big old farmhouse. There's one company inside and three flats. And um, the collector piping was made on the grass. And then we put it to the water it would swim so we had to put some some sandbags on it to to bring it a little bit under the level and if you fill it with the brine then it's going down to the ground here we have another farmhouse this is now now it is quite usual for us to do and uh, it's uh, renovated and put up to three flats for, for then the new usage and the source was here done in two days by one professional installer and the, the house owner and his father. Here we have on the south border of Austria to Slovenia in a, in a wine yard, a very beautiful, very old house. And uh, it's not really a wine heart, they are apple trees, um, peach trees. And um, the problem was we 
did not like to kill one of the trees. Also, the owner did not like to do this. And so we planned our collector system really around all those trees and uh, we were successful with it. Here you can see it quite good. We have here a mixture of this uh, of this uh, pipes in a small straight way and in rings on the other way. So we, we are very flexible with our designing. We can do nearly everything horizontal or vertical, and uh, we can really look at the plot of land, of the shape, of the circumstances, and try to fit in. This is uh, a project in the center of Vienna. Um, a very spectacular project because uh, the old bricks had to 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 stay alive and there was a new um, office usage house put inside these old bricks and uh, it was a multi-source project there were 29 uh, boreholes drilled under the platform and uh, the collector was laid inside it was in the first level a, a cooling collector but of course, we were also used use it for heating usage. It's um, there you see on the upper side the uh, tabs, thermal activated roof, and um, it's just going on public use now with a, a local here, the Steinhardt in Vienna, and uh, the office in the in the second and third floor. And this is from early this year, late winter, I think February, in Switzerland, in the hardcore in the middle of Switzerland. There is a very nice old village at the um, Vierwaldstättersee. And um, the base station of this railway, of this cable car, was renewed. You see here the project, the site. And we were asked for a ground source. And uh, we had to think a lot about the possibilities and solutions here. Finally, we put it under the rails. And you can see this here. This is the cable car for the first level going up the mountain. And on the second level, there is this gondola. It's a cabrio gondola. I think the only one in the world. There you see the, the line, the difference between the old rails and the new late rails. And under the new late rails, there's the, the source, the collector. And uh, coming to a finish, this is very, very actual. These are basically warm slides from the last three weeks. This is a castle here in Upper Austria. And uh, it's in a big renovation. All the surface is uh, made in new up and integrated in the surface work on the ground. Uh, we had to install the collector on the west part, on the eastern part. This is the eastern part which is now finished. You see here the eastern part fulfilled again. On the western part, we are already installing the ground collector. There is a manifold where all the pipes are brought together. And in one huge pipe, we go inside the house. And it's an energy net because we have different uh, usage types inside this uh, castle and uh, different heat pumps uh, all feed by one big source. And now we are looking for two or three days with a fine weather. We have really winter now in Austria to, to finish it in the next maybe two weeks. Okay, so I say thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anne, for the very interesting presentation. And I keep my fingers crossed to have like the every year occurring melting and high temperature before the Christmas period. So you can <laughs> install it before Christmas and have a nice present <laughs> under the tree. Thank you. <laughs> Are there some immediate questions in the audience? Otherwise, I would move on. To, I have written uh, one in the chat, but we can discuss this later. Okay. As you prefer, I think, Anne, if it is the thermally activated roof working as a solar collector, uh, what was the motivation for choosing this approach? Was the mm -hmm. question. Thank, thank you for the question. It's inside the insulation, it's on the warm side of the insulation, so it's like a fluor. 
uh, a ceiling heating. Primarily, it's a ceiling heating, but it's also a ceiling cooling. In summertime, it's the ceiling cooling. In wintertime, it's the ceiling heating. We use it for both uh, applications. But it's at 100% on the warm, on the insulated side inside the house. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay, I don't see someone in, is raising his hand. So I will move on to Gabriele. Um, Gabriele is the okay. director of the Innovation and Sustainable Finance at Euroheat and Power. And he will be our third speaker of today. And he will be talking about the waste heat topic of. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Let me share my screen. Can you hear me? Very well. Yes, yes. Okay. Perfectly fine. Uh, okay. Sure. Okay. Now Go we can through. see everything in full screen. Perfect. Perfect. It's great. Okay, yes. Um, very briefly, uh, when she already introduced myself, but uh, here I represent Eurit and Power. We are the uh, European Disheating and Cooling Association. So basically, we represent uh, around 150 members <clears throat> trying to advocate the disheating and cooling uh, towards the institution, but also uh, strongly, uh, say, lobbying for, uh, say, decarbonization of uh, our sector. Uh, very, very quickly, um, I'm not a technical people, uh, so after the very two technical presentation, I will be more uh, on explaining the potential wasted for uh, this heat and cooling in general for the uh, energy energy sector. So maybe at the beginning, we're going to start about the uh, importance of waste heat. Uh, I give you uh, an overview about the main policy framework for waste heat. Uh, then some financial and contractual aspects that characterized waste heat. And then I'm going to give you some example if we have time about some best practice of harvesting uh, waste heat. So I hope, uh, I'll say, uh, the, the other two speakers gave a great, I'll say, uh, presentation how heat pumps and geothermal energy works. So I prefer to give you a more high level and policy and regulator, uh, regulatory aspect of waste heat. So, um, OK, let's start with that. Uh, so I would like to start with this quote called that using gas or electricity for heating is like using a chainsaw to cut butter. What do you mean? Uh, of course, it's uh, an exaggeration, but what I mean here is that uh, we have waste heat and, and uh, basically uh, it's a one, in my opinion, one of the best and more efficient, most efficient way to, to, to heat, uh, say, uh, building in particular also industry. <clears throat> so um, talking about waste heat is fundamental in the light of, let's say, the recent, the recent energy crisis and the global impact of these uh, sovereign energy prices. So politically, uh, we notice uh, there was been always a significant focus on supply side measure, uh, especially on commendable push, of course, for renewable energy. Uh, however, as we saw uh, on, on short term fixes like increased natural gas import dominated the scene recently. So surprisingly, uh, structural efficiency measure, including innovative solutions like wasted recovery, uh, are often overlooked. So uh, the goal of today is, as I said, is also to highlight the hidden potential in reusing excess heat generated by various industry and other sectors. As we saw uh, from, from the, pre the previous uh, presentation, technology like heat pumps can harness this excess heat. Of course, heat pumps are fundamental, providing a cost-effective way to stabilize the electricity grid, of course, as I said, decarbonize heat networks and reduce overall energy demand. So implementing such solution could really lead to substantial savings and a smoother transition to a greener energy system. So in a sense, let's say in, in few words, it's not just about addressing the energy crisis, but also seizing this opportunity to make our energy usage more efficient, sustainable. So let's explore these uh, hidden reserves together in, in the slide that I'm going to follow. Um, so uh, very, very quickly. So picture this. As you walk through a building, the floor is covered by one euro bill or coin, let's say. 
would you simply continue working or carry on with your day or i would say let's say intelligently most even do that will likely take a moment to bend down and collect the money so surprisingly when it comes to excess eat we are metaphorically letting valuable resources slip away so there is a minimal effort to earn us and reduce excess seat in our building industry, and we don't do it. Technology is there. We just saw it. e pumps is just, as a mainstream now. The technology is not uh, reinventing the wheel, and despite that, we are not using it. Uh, I would, I, I think, I would skip. Uh, I'll say at the beginning, I was thinking to give you the very best definition we did, but I think the audience here is quite well prepared, so I would skip. Uh, the definition we did. Let's say that, of course, beyond heat pumps, uh, there are other technologies that can use to uh, we can use to harvest waste heat. So it's the changer, the um, ORC, uh, the cogeneration, uh, Stirling engines, uh, the Kalina cycle, and so on. I won't go into detail of this technology because, of course, there's not time. And it's not the goal of this presentation. So about the potential wasted. Generally, there is limited information available on the potential of excess seed in different areas. However, it's evident that a small fraction of the existing excess seed, both from traditional and unconventional sources, is currently being recovered and utilized on a large scale. Uh, I guess we all know that heating represents a significant portion of energy consumption, especially in Europe, where it constitutes around 50% of the annual final energy consumption. This is a mantra they always repeat, but it's very important to, to remind everyone. And most of this heat is still generated using fossil fuel, primary, as we know, natural gas. Uh, interestingly, urban areas in Europe have access to considerable excess heat resources. Uh, as we can see from this slide, totally about around almost 3000 terawatt hours per year in the European Union. To put this into perspective, uh, it's nearly equivalent to the EU total energy demand for residential and service sector heating, which is approximately 3100 80 terawatt hours per year in the European Union. So this gives you a little bit the magnitude of the potential of waste to uh, really supply the heating demands in the European Union. For example, in some countries, the excess heat potential align with the total heat demand. For example, the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, excess heat uh, amount around 150 terawatt hours per year. So slightly surpassing the water and space heating demand of 152 terawatt hours per year. Uh, this pattern, of course, is not unique to all Europe. Uh, for example, it's also taken globally, uh, the pers global perspective. So, for example, northern China, I saw in a recent study, uh, the industrial sector alone produced around 800 terawatt hours of excess seat during the heating season. So this showcases, I think, the immense potential of excess seat uh, over all the world. So uh, basically, the main uh, I'm gonna explain it later, but the main, uh, the, roughly the main source of the uh, waste heat uh, are uh, sewage water, 42%, something that is underground that we never think about it. Then we have data center, is a very emerging uh, heat uh, waste heat sources. Uh, the tertiary sector uh, around 20%, the residential sector 80%, and then we have a smaller, I'll say, uh, potential heat sources like uh, waste heat sources, of course, food production, food retail, and metro. Uh, on on the on the right side, you can see some example of the heat demand of some cities. So, for example, Brussels, the city where I live, the heat demand in general for residential is 1.5 terawatt hour a year, and just the top three sites in all Brussels could provide 1.3 terawatt. In London, that is much bigger than Brussels, the uh, heat demand is 9.5 terawatt hour, and also here the top three sites in London could provide almost half of the heat demand. So, it's it's uh, it's uh, I'll say it's suffice to say that say West Heat could really uh, provide a solution to decarbonize the heat sector in Europe. Okay, so uh, of course I have a bias here. I'm gonna speak, I'm gonna focus much more on DC heating uh, because also of course, I, I work for the DC heating sector, but also because I believe that heating and cooling network can harness 
different kind of, uh, of solution. So using access heat offers spectrum solution, as we said in the previous chart, ranging from simple application with the unit to advance this heating system. Uh, so this heating system of say, uh, Excel in integrating different wasted sources, gradually phasing out fossil fuel from the heating and cooling mix. Uh, of course, as we said also previously, we are now in the fourth generation and we are slowly entering the fifth generation, even though the academic and the technical community doesn't like this generation classification. I think it's the easiest way to explain uh, the status of the art of the heat networks. And the more we go on, the more we accommodate very low temperature heat sources for new building, uh, operating efficiently on low temperature. And send this uh, allow the harnessing of very low uh, heat grade sources like wasted. Of course, very quickly, one of the main wasted sources in, in the industry, of course, industry produce a lot uh, of heat uh, wasted. The industrial sector contributes significantly to the global energy carbon emission, as we know, uh, around 40%, let's say. Uh, however, I would say with a current energy efficiency improvement rate of around 1% per year, I'll say we are quite far away from the net zero scenario of the 3% target we should have. Uh, so what's in this case, we still can contribute uh, say despite this very slow progress of, uh, of of industry in decarbonizing the heat, uh, there is untapped potential in utilizing excess heat. In the EU, just in the EU, industrial side present the largest source of excess heat, uh, exceeding around 270 terawatt hour annually, surpassing the combined heat generation of Germany, Poland, and Sweden. And some specific urban area like uh, Essen in Germany showcase in some recent search substantial excess heat production equivalent to heating around 1.2 million of households. So just the Essen region in, in Germany. Um, of course, the main uh, industry here are the heavy industry, including cement, uh, chemical, steel, which account for nearly 60% of the global industrial energy demand. And they offer significant efficient potential to the high temperature excess heat. So here we are speaking about high level, high, high temperature. Um, so as we said, uh, while the industrial sector faced challenging in meeting the net zero emission milestone, leveraging excess heat presents an opportunity to enhance global energy efficiency. Uh, of course, we can reuse industrial excess heat, supply heat and warm water within the factory, or we can export it to neighboring homes and industries through this heating system. So waste heat can be used both locally and in the district approach. Then, an emerging, an emerging waste heat sources are data center uh, that are emerging as substantial contributors to excess heat. The servers within this center produce heat equivalent to the electricity consumption, and the cooling process generates additional excess heat. We say notably the flow of excess heat from data center is continuous. Because of course, we always need cooling uh, for, for them. And uh, I'll say uh, dependable also, making it, let's say, a reliable uh, source of clean energy. Uh, numerous, I'll uh, say several, several searches, researchers showcase the feasibility of using data center excess heat either to work nearby buildings to a microgrid or export it to the district energy network for diverse application. So another very interesting uh, uh, potential wasted sources is the tertiary sector. Uh, say I call it tertiary sector encompassing like uh, um, supermarkets, hospital, um, and here wasted recovery hold immense potential for enhancing energy efficiency. For example, supermarkets with a refrigerator and air conditioning system generate substantial excess heat that can be repurposed to meet heating demands within the facility, again, or contribute to nearby these heating networks. Also, hospital, for example, with the extensive heating and cooling requirements, produce significant waste heat from various equipment and system. Uh, I'll say also in this case, uh, I'll say even though in the chart we saw that tertiary sector is very small, uh, has also a big, also big potential. Uh, another emerging and quite niche, let's say, uh, excess heat source is from metro station. 
uh, that is obtained through the ventilation shaft or station platform tunnels. If you ever enter the London metro system, for example, you notice that it's very warm even in 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 in, in summer. Uh, you sometimes you need to 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 undress because it's quite unbearable, and all this all this waste uh, all this heat is wasted. So basically, this involves extracting both both sensible and latent heat from the air. Uh, primarily heat by electricity power and train carriage, as you know, uh, auxiliary system. Uh, and the heat also dissipated during the braking of the train stop the platform. Uh, so, of course, uh, the metro the harvesting, harvesting wasted from metro station is a little bit more difficult. Uh, for example, it's crucial that the metro station and the location requiring heat to be in close proximity to minimize the cost of pipelines. And also the metro system adhere to strict safety regulation that's limit a little bit the construction, maintaining access to times when trains are not operational, even though it's quite, uh, quite, uh, I would say, common in, in many European cities to have to have a metro metro system. Also, the temperature of this heat uh, exhibit, let's say, uh, seasonability. So increase and reduce according to the season compare, uh, in the, so compared to other systems that are more uh, stable. Um, and then also another very interesting uh, uh, waste heat sources is the uh, water sector. According to the uh, International Energy Agency, I would say the water sector consume around 120 million tons of oil equivalent. Uh, nearly matching Australia total energy consumption that give you the magnitude also in this case. Um, so there exists substantial potential for energy savings also in the water sector. And wastewater in particular holds significant embedded energy. Uh, so extracting sludge from wastewater and directing into digester can yield biogas. In, in particular biomethane, which can then be utilized from heat and electricity generation. So consequently, I say wastewater treatment plants possess the potential to transition for energy consumer to energy producers. And then, of course, um, we see it recovery from sewage presents another avenue of sustainable energy utilization. Sewage system carries substantial thermal energy, a lot of hot water that used for showers and 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 and, and basically uh, washing uh, washing activity it's just discharge uh, so it's predominantly already heated water that is uh, is wasted so implementing wasted recovery technology in sewage treatment process allow for the extraction of this energy which can then be of course utilized for heating purpose or electricity generation through heat pumps so I think I give you quite a, a big overview of the all the potential wasted sources. Um, so now on the on the on the policy side, uh, we are quite uh, we are quite uh, happy to say that the recent policy framework is very favorable. Uh, say we we fought and we advocate a lot for recognition of of waste heat at the EU level, and uh, I'll say there is a clear focus on waste heat recovery in the recent Fit for 55 uh, package. I'm gonna give you some key measure uh, from the in particular from the renewable Renewable Energy uh, Directive, the, the third, I'll say, edition, the Red 3, it's called, and of course, the other, uh, I'll say, very uh, relevant um, legislative initiative is the Energy Efficiency Directive. So we have new sectoral targets for renewable and waste heat. Uh, for building industry heating and cooling and this heating and cooling. So uh, each sector should reach a certain level or percentage of use of renewable and waste heat. So in this case, waste heat is considered as renewable as the other energy sources. We have a new definition of efficient DC heating and cooling network that I'm going to explain you later. Uh, of course, EU is really um, suggesting coordination framework 
uh, is asking more than suggestive, is asking coordination framework between different actors. This is very important because I think it's about community and also is, for example, it's clear uh, example where we have different stakeholders that should collaborate to harvest waste it, local waste it sources. And this collaboration is fundamental. Then, of course, we mentioned the waste uh, wasted from data center and also here we have mandatory wasted recovery for data center that produce uh, more than one megawatt of, uh, of energy. Uh, then, of course, as gonna we say later, uh, you member states should develop risk mitigation framework for renewable because wasted and bad some risk we're gonna see later. And I think we you already have a, a train the trainer session on planning. If I'm not wrong, it's gonna be later. Uh, so planning, municipal heating and cooling planning for cities above 45,000 inhabitants is gonna be mandatory. And this is very, 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 uh, very important. Um, so um, I'm gonna very go very quickly here. I uh, see this here. This uh, uh, we have a new. I've, we new uh, definition of waste heat, uh, sorry, uh, of this heating and cooling. Uh, this is very important because show the importance of waste heat in the heat networks, and also I would say the importance for uh, for uh, cities and community to uh, to to have the chance to decarbonize the heat networks. Uh, basically, until 2028, to be to be considered an efficient heating cooling system, we should have uh, this mix of 50 percent of renewable energy or waste heat or 75% of cogeneration, or 50% of combination of renewable energy, wasted, or uh, or cogeneration. Uh, I'm gonna go, I'm not going into detail of all steps, but just to give you the example from 2045, to be considered an efficient district heating and cooling system, Basically, uh, each the, the network should use around 75% of renewable energy and waste heat. And as you can see from 20 from 2015, uh, the, the heat network should use 100% uh, renewable energy waste heat. Just this is like to just give you an example of how uh, waste heat is gonna be increasingly important. For, for for heat networks for the heating uh, uh, and cooling sector. Another very important, uh, I'll say, and it's very fundamental for waste heat here and also for energy communities and towns, is this, uh, I'll say, mandatory multiple heat planning. I won't go into detail. I'll say, um, I think this is a pivotal step to towards sustainable urban development. Uh, we know that I'll say uh, cities are the main, uh, I'll say the main uh, environment of, of heat demand. And this plan play a crucial role in optimizing energy use, promoting efficiency and reducing environmental impact. And one significant opportunity arising from this plan is the focus on the recovery of urban waste heat. Uh, as cities, as you know, generate substantial heat from various sources we just saw, like industrial, transportation, commercial, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I would say by prioritizing waste heat recovery into the cooling plants, cities uh, not only enhance the, the resilience, but also take strides toward achieving environmental scientific goals. So basically, they can create a more livable and eco-friendly urban environments. Um, also, local heat and cooling planning is essential also because each region possesses unique characteristics such as building types, geology, weather patterns and available heat sources. For example, a strategy effective in a Portuguese town might not be applicable in a Polish town. Moreover, I say engaging citizen group local business, industry, health and education organization, and of course, energy utilities in the strategy development and implementation is best achieved at local level. So it's really, really important to have a local dimension here. Um, of course, city requires support beyond the local effort. More than half of European countries necessitate a new legislative framework a national level. So we got the new level, but now we have we need a national level to accompany support system for these towns and cities. Uh, so 
Also, we are, I'll say, calling for a new heat strategy, and that could be mirror in national legislat uh, legislative framework. Uh, of course, national support should extend beyond financial aid, but also should encompass various ways for member states to assist city. Uh, for example, when we are implementing the energy efficiency directive that, directive that uh, I just uh, mentioned, member states must align the legal framework for local authorities with existing obligation and integrating with national regional decarbonization strategy that we set. Of course, another very important stuff for planning is the tackling support. Uh, say member state uh, should support, should give a guidance document, training and working group to assist the municipalities in developing this heat and planning. Uh, okay, I stop here because I guess we already spoke about planning is true, Matthias. We you have already a uh, trained the trainer uh session on planning so I, I i i stop here just to that i think i wanted to focus on planning because i think it's as i said it's fundamental for waste heat recovery to recognize where you can harvest uh, local waste heat sources okay so let's speak about a little bit the difficulty uh um so uh as I repeat uh, now to several time, uh, we have an immense potential for sustainable uh, energy practice, but we have several barriers that impede this widespread adoption. I would say overcoming this challenge is crucial to unlock the full benefits of using the excess seat in various sectors. Uh, I'll say. Um, I'll say, let's say, uh, even though our regulatory side, at new level, we advance significantly, as I said in the 50 for 55 slide, we have many other barriers and challenges that slow down the harness of waste heat utilization. Uh, I'll say, uh, first of all, uh, we have the existence of subsidies that favorized established already, already established renewable solution that pose an additional harder for investment in herbal waste heat. A subsidized option, of course, tend to be more attractive than non-subsidized alternative. And sometimes renewable are more subsidized than waste heat. So even though it could sound uh, paradoxical, economic incentive for renewable sometimes uh, um, slow down the use of urban waste heat. So we need incentives also for waste heat. Secondly, we have the technical immaturity of some urban waste heat recovery system that I'll say pose a uh, challenge. I'll say this investment in this technical solution involving unconventional heat sources and heat recovery to heat pumps, for example, sometimes face low maturity level of various stage implementation, design, heat source awareness, and customer recognition. So this low maturity results in a weak demand for urban heat recovery solution, creating, let's say, a vicious cycle, cycle where the lack of customer demand leads to exclusion from construction and furbishment projects. So limiting availability from installer. So it's quite a conundrum that I would say uh, it's quite also in this case paradoxical. Uh, third, um, we have when we talk about perception, very perception regarding the worth of urban waste heat, uh, it's an also another very important challenge. I would say to foster clearer discussion consensus, we need to establish standard and categorization for waste heat. Uh, it, it's very important. I'll say here we're speaking about not the worth in terms of uh, the potential, but more the economic and financial worth of uh, wasted sources. Then we're going to see its contractual sites very important. The absence of standardized contracts pose a practical challenge. The low maturity in urban wasted recovery necessitate initiating contractual discussion for each investment. So Yes, sorry, Matthias. Just four minutes approximately. Oh, really? Okay, okay. And then, of course, lack of awareness is, I think, is the one of the last uh, uh, slides. Um, I'm gonna go uh, say more more quicker. Uh, sorry. So, uh, as we said, we, one of the best, more important aspect of waste heat is the contractual issue. 
so we need to, well, to we need well designed contracts to share and distribute risk because the one of the main factor here is that waste utilization pose some risk we need to uh, allocate the risk in an equal manner between parties so um, according to some best practice say public private partnership are one of the best example uh, so not also in this case reinventing the wheel um so this is for very natural markets, let's say like Sweden, Denmark, and so on. For a less natural market, I think another good example is the ESCON and energy uh, energy performance contracting. Uh, they, they they show a, a very good solution. Um, of course, I would say uh, in general, beside the contractual uh, stuff, we also need to scale up uh, project to gather more project to make them more bankable. Um, let's go. I'm gonna go to these last two uh, slides. So uh, these are the main factor to design a perfect contract for urban waste heat recovery. This is very important, I think. Uh, as as I said, uh, we need to take in consideration the low maturity of installation. Uh, so you can see here the technical viability of urban waste heat should be validated. In fact, we know that system innovation are not yet proven sometime, even though, we, or for example, heat pumps are well, well validated. But sometimes the use of heat pumps in specific, uh, in specific uh, context uh, are not yet uh, mature enough. Then, of course, as already mentioned, there are no legal framework in place. So we don't have a, a uniform legislation for waste heat, and this poses a barrier. Uh, of course, these drive risk and, and, and sometimes offense investment. In addition, there are no demand side incentive for urban waste heat because, of course, there's low awareness of urban waste heat recovery. Then, as I already mentioned, the, the value of waste heat is subjective. So we need a common and standardized uh, way of analyzing the worth and, and the value of waste heat. This could create, I would say, uh, better assessment due diligence for, for the bankability of projects and also to uh, design and to identify the best waste heat sources. Uh, then we have the, bake, the payback period, I say um, also in this case, we need more training to evaluate the payback period, even though some searches show that, for example, for um, for hospital and metro station, the payback period is shorter than five years. It's very good. Then another very important factor is the asymmetric information. So, for example, the parties, the energy company and the waste heat owner, the supplier, need to understand and integrate each other processes. So, for example, investor that made the people that put money have a shortcoming in terms of this heat and urban waste heat recovery in particular. They know they don't know exactly what uh, how it works and 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 uh, the more, more factor in terms of uh, uh, availability and and uh, and uh, and uh, liability of of these uh, of these uh, heat uh, sources. Shared incentive. So, as I said, shared incentive. So, uh, having a sharing incentive can be establishing long term, could be mutually beneficial. Uh, so, um, this can be really an advantage when we enter in urban waste heat recovery contracts. For example, there is a shared incentive to reduce CO2. And at the end, the last factor is termination of heat recovery. So the risk of non-heat delivery is important to address in many contracts uh, because, of course, you need to uh, consider and to ensure that if the heat is not anymore delivered, uh, the uh, heat demand, so the energy company in this particular is covered by this risk. OK, I rush a little bit in these last two slides, sorry. I think it is not any more time. It's 11.40. Uh, maybe, uh, Matthias, you will share the, the presentation, right? Later. So at the end of my presentation, you will find some nice example of wasted recovery from various uh, sources. So here in Dublin, we have the um, a data center. Uh, here we have uh, hydrogen electrolysis. Uh, here we have a refrigeration center. Um, and uh, in in Copenhagen, we have a shopping mall, data center, and a bank. In London, the metro system. Uh, here we use a case when, uh, uh, sorry, there is a case that use ammonia heat pumps in Malmo. 
and here very low grade waste heat using heat and it's quite interesting from particle accelerator. This is very skyrocketing science. I like it so much. So I really suggest you to have a look to this best practice uh, in, a, in, a, in a second, in a later time. OK, that's all. Sorry, I rushed a little bit to stay in time. Uh, if you have questions, I'm available. Yeah, thank you, Gabriele, and thank you all to all speakers again for, for giving your presentations. So I've seen there have been a couple of questions in the chat and already be answered. Um, are there some other questions? Otherwise, I would maybe reflect on these questions that have been stated in the chat um, and start with this ones. So one was about the, um, the, the temperature levels of the of the heat pump systems that are, have been discussed. And I would also invite to and extend the, the scope of the question to Harald and, and, and to get the absorption heat pump systems as well on board. What would you see as, as, as a suitable temperature level from, from the boundary conditions of the of the heat source to to drive this absorption heat pump systems? And yeah, I think Anne, maybe you can answer as well afterwards then. The temperature level for the uh, absorption heat pumps is explained uh, easily uh, with a slide and therefore uh, uh, sharing my screen again. And you typically have uh, between the district heating water coming in and the cold water temperature you typically have 25 to, to 30 Kelvin. And the driving temperature for the heat pump is typically 150, 155 degrees C if you go on pressurized hot water or steam. Uh, in some cases, meaning when you have district heating returns of 50 degrees C or lower, uh, you, we drive the heat pump with only 105 degrees C. And uh, depending, as in my presentation, depending on the type of machine, the cold water source can be 40 degree, 30 degree, 11 degree. Uh, it depends on the project. So two temperature levels, one approximately above 100 degrees and the other one um, on a very low temperature level. Yet to be the motivation used. for going on the so-called 105 degree C systems is to avoid the most strict regulations of the pressure equipment directive, which means that you have specially trained pe uh, personnel on site. You need the TÜV or uh, other uh, institution as notified body for checking uh, your delivery and the systems. This is a an, uh, an remarkable extra effort. And that is why we sometimes uh, go for only 105 degrees C. OK, thanks. OK, <laughs> I will uh, try to follow. First, thanks to Gabriele for his presentation. It was so much on the point, and I would take all the sources he showed up to us. Everyone would be perfect for me. Great, thank um, you. Uh, about the temperature level for our um, for example, cold district heating or uh, uh, flat heat pumps um, at all. On the source side, uh, if we go into the ground, if we look to very shallow systems, to flat systems, we make with uh, digging, with excavation machines, we go between 1 meter 50 up to 2 meters inside the ground. We have a natural temperature level from maybe 5 to 15 degrees. That's the average, the, the natural level. If we go deeper by drilling, it's uh, completely stable when we go deeper than maybe 30 meters. It uh, rises uh, two uh, three uh, degrees Celsius each hundred meters. So it's uh, in a typical depth of maybe 100 to 200 meters of 11, 12, 13 degrees, and it's completely flat, not influenced by the season, summer, or winter time. In the on the warm side, on the delivery side of the heat pumps in the in the flats, we can run radiators as well. But the higher the radiator temperature goes, the lower the efficiency goes. It's directly connected. So the limit is somewhere between maybe 50, 55, about this. The technical side, the machine can deliver, goes up to 60, 65, 70 degrees. 
but uh, not with the efficiency we would like to earn with the heat pump system. If we use uh, flat delivery systems, floor heating, wall heating, ceiling heating in new well uh, insulated buildings, we can see temperatures lower than 30 degrees. We really see temperatures maybe 75, 78 uh, degrees, and then we can reach seasonal performances of five up to six. And that's uh, what we want to do. We want to make the heat pump no direct electric heating machine. We want to see it as an efficiency wonder. Maybe I would have a quick follow up for a question. Um, when you have this lower temperatures of 30, 40 degrees, how do you deal with the hot water supply? I mean, there are regulations that the hot water should be above 60 degrees. Yes. And so how do you deal with this? I mean, in single family homes, you can always. Yes, uh, a very good a question. But, but yeah. In single flat homes, we don't have regulations. We can do what we see, what is the best for efficiency and also hygienic reasons. And um, if we go to um, in the cities, residential homes, then uh, we really have to uh, change uh, the direction these buildings are set up. Central water delivery will not be the way in the future. It will be, it will have decentral water systems with little water storage, like I showed in my slides in the flats. This will be the solution for the heat pump. Then we don't have these huge circulation systems, which are very, very inefficient and also not the best if you look on the hygienic side. Okay, so in the in the refurbished buildings you showed, then you need to have a solution also for the hot water, and yeah. that is with the st yeah. Yeah. storage. Yeah, done we, by the we, storage in the apartments. Yes, yes. From the technical side, we can do it central also with heat pumps, but not with the efficiency we want to see. Okay. Is there someone else also having questions? Otherwise, no. I'm We'll shut up for 30 seconds and wait a bit. In this case, maybe uh, uh, it's interesting that I share uh, one interesting consideration that I uh, heard in the past. This is a district heating supply, uh, 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 supplier of a, a smaller town, a smaller area, rural area in Austria. And he considers shutting off the district heating grid in summertime and serving the few hot water clients uh, with uh, local electric heat pumps using the district heating grid itself as low temperature source. So this means he would benefit from the remaining 60 degree, 50 degree, 40 degree in the grid pipes. And when uh, having used up this remaining energy, he still would have a not so bad earth collector with the many, many meters of pipes in the ground. Yeah, uh, a very good point, and uh, it's really different from the single flat house to the to the villages to the concentrated population, and um, we have many many solutions nowadays. We have uh, water heat pumps, uh, decent well for the flats. We can use the fluor heating as a source. So in winter time, we have some kind of two levels operating the first with maybe 30, 35 degrees for heating. And then the second, the booster heat pump, taking those 30, 35 degrees as the source and pushing it up to 50 degrees. And in summertime, the, the, um, the, the fluor heating is used like a collector, and so we have a cooling effect as well. And that's the, the perfect way we can run a heat pump. We run the heat pump in the middle, pumping the heat, and have two uses, cooling as a benefit and heating as a benefit at the same time. Yeah, I know there are very uh, large portfolio of use cases out there yeah. where heat pumps are ideally suited to be the solution or the connector between this these issues um i would have one more topic i would like to discuss from my experience with working or providing guidance to the uh, wien energy to the district heating operator in vienna it was always very complicated and and to implement more modern sources they they uh, state themselves to be in the seventh generation of their district heating grid so 
not sure about the fourth, fifth, and and so on, um, as they have started with nearly 200 degrees hot water in their pipes in the early stages, and and now they're trying to transfer the grid even more. But when we talked about implementing waste heat sources, especially, um, there have always been some issues why this is very complicated in the beginning. Um, for example, with data centers, we tried to, to push them to use the waste heat from data centers. First, the temperature level and the, the, the entry point to the district heating grid would not have been ideal as the data centers have quite regularly been placed somewhere in the outskirts of the city and not in the, the main. And there have also been um, severe threats of of entering of people entering the data centers um, as a security issue uh, do you have um, all the good solutions or good examples um, where this worked out and especially in data centers and that are not located in the city center how are they implemented in the district heating grid and in the end is this something that is quite common nowadays because I've worked on this topic uh, several years ago, and that was not that um, frequently used. So I've seen you had one one example. Yeah, Gabriel. Uh, yes, one. One of the most recent example uh, is Dublin, the city of Dublin. They, uh, they basically they set up a new uh, a new network. Uh, harvesting waste heat from data center from Amazon in particular. But as you know, Dublin is, uh, I would say, the headquarter of many Silicon Valley, uh, Silicon Valley uh, companies. Those they full of data center all around the city. So not in the city center, but in the ring, let's say. Um, I'll say I'm looking at the uh, slides on on this project um, around the the the, the I'll say the heat demand covered by the data center is. 20, sorry, the temperature uh, is 25 degree uh, and they use a large scale heat pumps to increase the temperature to 70, 85 degree. Um, in general, let's say uh, what you said for the for Vienna is exactly what I just presented in sense that we have a low maturity sometime of, uh, of of technology in terms that or they don't know how to do it. So we need training for operators and also awareness from the data center owners. We need a standardized contract, as I said, in sense that you need to uh, give a clear uh, condition so what you need, what you can do, for example, even accessing the data center. So if you have uh, clear rules on how to use it, that's I'll say lower the risk and I'll say give more guarantee to the parties. Um, for example, on low maturity, I'm thinking about the uh, also new material for pipes, because if the uh, heat uh, delivery is very low grade, you need to be very, very, very efficient. So if the data center is located a little bit far away from the, the urban I'll say, center, you need to transport the heat in a very efficient way. So you need very pre-insulated pipes in very, very new innovative materials. You need also leakage detection and, and optimization of the network through digital solution. So when we speak about low maturity, it's not just heat pump, and, and the wasted sources in all the <clears throat> value chain and all the distribution side also of the heat network where we still have very low technical readiness for for some so for some uh, factors such as the pipes for example mm. yeah. i'm speaking about existing networks for example yeah. in dublin a brand new network they already make it wasted ready and yeah. it's easier and it's easy going basically yeah. Harald, you'd like to follow up? Yeah, actually, uh, three sh very short comments on uh, the previous uh, uh, topics or questions. Uh, Vienna District Energy, uh, Wien Energy, uh, just so that everybody is, has the same picture, they have a big primary grid running on 160 degrees C and a little more than 500 local subgrids that go to the clients almost not a single client on the primary grid 
and therefore we have one huge, huge high temperature grid. And when going for efficiency solutions, uh, we should target to go directly to the lower temperature uh, uh, local grids. Second comment to data systems, uh, water-cooled uh, 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 data center equipment, like for example, available from ABM, can deliver cooling water at 60 degrees C, which is pretty, pretty high. Uh, in a new project, this might be discussed. Last point, uh, I made a connection between uh, two companies, one large uh, greenhouse company, and one industrial site that has a, a high amount of waste heat. And at the moment, they discussed the realization of a seven megawatt waste, waste heat project for the greenhouses. And this can serve as an example for other regions. If you have some clients like greenhouses that can benefit from relatively low temperature heat, uh, please uh, check where you might install them where you might build them. This can have very nice coincidences. That was it. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. We also discussed it to implement it in the lower temperature grid, but then they said like, yeah, no way that we use that much energy in this low temperature grid. Um, other circumstances pop up. But yeah, very interesting point and very good point. Anna, you want to follow up as well? Yeah, Matthias, you you should uh, come back to Vienna to talk to the to the district, to the regulators, because I think they have uh, moved uh, a lot far away. I have many contacts to them and uh, regular uh, conversations with them, and they say with the high temperature grid, they are really scaled out. There is not much more they can reach, but with low temperature grids, with cold grids, they can reach each house because if you have uh, the non-insulated grid. The grid as a collector, it's not a problem if if uh, the population is not so high per square meter if you go to the more outside areas of the village. And uh, last week we had a geothermal symposium on the border between Austria and Germany. And there were two presentations, one looking for the potential with deep thermal use. We talk about three, four, five thousand meters below the surface. We get thermal water with 100, 120 degrees directly out from the earth. And uh, Vienna is sitting on the maybe largest uh, um, shots. Pressure. Pre uh, sorry. Treasure, the largest treasure, treasure. Treasure on the largest, thank you, on the largest treasure in whole Europe as a as a capital. And uh, uh, Vienna Energy says uh, we can now um, earn this and supply 30% of the demand of our hot grid with this thermal water and replace uh, gas from Russia one to one. And uh, they they are now um, looking further to how how big this reservoir below the village is and uh, they think they have the potential to go nearly up to 100 percent with deep thermal water on the other side there was a presentation for um, borehole exchanges in the village in public uh, areas like uh, parking slots and we could drill a source in a public slot for one car and on the next day going two further and the next and the next and the next and the next and this study says the potential in the city not with so much with collectors but as well but with uh, borehole exchanges is also nearly up to 100 percent so a double green supply of vienna is possible only with the two main goals Harald, do you want to comment on this, or is your sign still up from before? Other... Otherwise, I did not <laughs> want to 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 spot Wien Energy that much and the district heating system of the city of Vienna. I know they are they have it since a very long time, so they are in the transformation process, which is can be tricky. They have innovative people working there and trying to find solutions. Um, so I didn't want to be misunderstood. They are very innovative and they are doing good things. And just one comment on, on the district heating system as a grid. The same is accountable also for the sewage system, um, which I experienced that the, especially when we talked about waste heat recovery from sewage systems, the, the plant operator said, yeah, that's ideally you can do it, but please have a minimum distance from our plant, um, the waste heat uh, um, 
the extraction of the waste heat because then we don't even feel it because when we have three kilometers of pipes before it, we enter the sewage um, plant, then it's the same temperature as we would have just received it without your extraction. So mm -hmm. this is something that um, I just wanted to add on. I think we have very much advanced in time. I'm sorry today, I'm, I'm, I'm not a strict moderator as I normally am. And maybe this is because it was so interesting for me and it, it reflects a lot of the background that I've been working on a couple of years, for a couple of years. But if there are no immediate questions or comments, I would move on and try to close the session uh, as it deserves. Marta will pull up some slides again. Thanks for this. Um, just a couple of brief words. So we have done, we have had a great presentation and a very technical and political presentation on on heat pumps, um, covering from from policy to all planning stages. So a wide scope of of on, on was put on the heat pumps and and connecting topics. I want to thank again Anne, Harald, Gabriel for presenting today. It was an honor to have you here. And on the next slide, I want to introduce that our next session will be already on the 11th of December, uh, focusing on financial tools and business models. Um, and so a couple of, of these barriers that have been highlighted today might be answered, or we might find some tools and tricks how to overcome those barriers in the next session on the 11th of December. From the formality, we are going to upload the materials and uh, and the video recordings of this presentation to our toolbox and we will inform you as soon as this is done and on the next slide i think we still have our survey um feedback survey so it would be great to receive your feedback how you have experienced this session today and Feedback is always important to improve and to get better for the next ones. So please let us know what you think. And with this, I'm coming to the very end and thank you for the additional couple of minutes that I stole of your time today. And Marta is, wants to say maybe something. I just wanted to say that for those who cannot scan the QR code, I will share in the chat uh, the link to the satisfaction survey. And yeah, as Matthias was saying, please fill it out. It would be very useful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And with this, we can close the day. I want to thank again all the team and all the participants and thank for today. You for Thank you for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to present. It was a pleasure to have you all here and I wish you a nice Thursday afternoon then. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye. Thank you Bye. so much. Ciao, ciao. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Lems.